Hello everyone. Hopefully that's switching over. Hello, hello. Uh, welcome to Why in the World, uh, where we're going to delve into history to gain a deeper understanding of the world we live in today. Uh, in this episode, we're going to be exploring one of the most pivotal moments in European history. That is the division of Charlemagne's empire uh, after his son's death. Um, this event set in motion a chain of events that would shape the continent for centuries to come and arguably the entire world. Uh, it led to a millennia of war and conflict. So let's have a little look. Uh, this is my first time running the podcast. Uh, so expect a couple of uh, potential technical difficulties. Um, I am currently streaming it live on Twitch, which is where I'm going to be uh, streaming them uh, in the future. And I'll be uploading it to Spotify uh, as soon as we're done here. So uh, we'll, we'll get straight into it. Uh, so why did I choose this as the topic for the first one? Partly it's because no one else uh, was here and I feel like this is a topic that I can cover by myself. Another key aspect of the podcast is eventually, and quite often I'm sure, you will hear the dog deciding to play with her squeaky toy. That's just something you're going to have to get used to. Um, this topic is one that I find absolutely fascinating though. Uh, sometimes an event sends echoes throughout history, and, and one of those echo echoes is the, the fallout and and. and what was left over from uh, the division of the land from Charlemagne. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you on a map here what I mean. This might not work so great for the uh, people listening to this on Spotify, uh, but we will, uh, I'll, I'll try and give you as, as good a description of the map as I possibly can. So with a little bit of movie magic, hopefully if I get this right, uh, we go over here. And we go, ha ha ha. Here we go. So this map here shows um, what I'm going to be discussing. So Charlemagne himself was the king of the Franks. His father Pepin uh, united uh, a decent chunk of the Franks in an area of now northern France called Austrasia. Um, they were a Frankish group, uh, a Germanic group rather, uh, who moved across the Rhine uh, towards the late Roman Empire. Uh, they did become slightly Romanized, um, but they, they came across and set up in that kind of northwestern part of France. Uh, there would be a load of, of conquests from their kings um, over the course of the next couple of hundred years with the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, and eventually Charlemagne took over from his dad. Charlemagne went on a massive, massive conquest spree. He conquered territories all the way from northern France, all the way down into the Arabian, uh, the Arabian, the Iberian Peninsula, all the way down into Italy, which you can see here on the map. He liberated Rome from the Lombards. He uh, got the the Pope to coron coronate him as the new Roman Emperor. All this territory here that you can see uh, in central Germany he conquered he uh was going around uh, christianizing and uh, quote unquote civilizing um people like the saxons uh the the bavarians all of those kind of disparate groups in central europe when he died uh his empire went to his son louis the pious um which was fine you know there was a couple of rebellions but overall it was one guy uh that the empire went to he took over the empire and eventually uh, a couple of years later uh, in 1840, uh, sorry, 840 rather, he died. Now, Louis the Pious had three sons. Two of those were from his first marriage uh, and one of those was from his second marriage. He in insisted that um, his son from his second marriage would be included in the line of succession. Now, these days, when you look at places like or, or institutions like uh, the Kingdom of Britain, like the Kingdom of Spain, Sweden, whatever, you think of what's called uh, primogeniture. Uh, back in the day, it would have been agnatic primogeniture, which means um, uh, only male succession. 
uh, and it means that everything goes to the firstborn. Sometimes you get agnatic, cognatic succession, uh, primogeniture, which would be the uh, male preference primogeniture. So if there was uh, a female rule, uh, female heir uh, and no males were available, it would go to the, the female. But that was not the case for the Carolingians. Uh, it was a bit of a, a Germanic um, holdover. Uh, there was a system called Gavelkind. Those of you that play Crusader Kings and that sort of game will know and, and uh, recognize that term, hopefully. Um, that is essentially, it means among children. So everyone, all of his descendants, um, all of his you know, direct descendants uh, would get a slice of the pie. The kids were the uh, they were Lothia of Middle Francia, uh, which is the kind of central green um, band here that covered um, the modern day Netherlands or a significant chunk of it and a bit of northwest Germany, kind of Frisia um, and that sort of region, all the way down through Burgundy, all the way down into Provence, uh, across the Alps, and into Lombardy or Lombardy, however you like to say it. Um, he was given that stretch of territory to hold. Um, the, uh, his sibling, uh, Louis the German, or uh, Louis the German of uh, East Francia, uh, he was given this yellow stretch here, which was obviously full of Germans, uh, funnily enough. Uh, and you can see that that kind of flanked all the way down. It included central Germany, or modern day central Germany, down into Bavaria, uh, and even into um, a parts of modern day Croatia, Slovenia, and uh, the former Illyrian provinces of the Roman Empire. Um, his other son, Charles the Bold, uh, was given West Francia, which is this part here. It includes Flanders, it includes um, modern day France, you know, the majority of modern day France at least, um, and all the way down into uh, northeast, what is now northeastern Spain. So as you can see, uh, and for those that are, are listening later, um, the central state here, Middle Francia, makes absolutely no sense. It has two massive borders uh, to cover. The dog is just the upstairs. Go on, off you go. Bedtime. Um, <laughs> I need to do this during the day when she's a bit less uh, needy. Um, the modern day, uh, sorry, the, the, the green state in the center there has absolutely, it has huge borders that it needs to defend. It has absolutely none of its borders marked by natural features like, you know, rivers or, or mountains. In fact, you can see it actually kind of goes through the middle of the Alps, which just it makes absolutely no sense defensively. That state was was essentially there um, as as... Uh, a token for the others to just gobble up. It was not a sustainable state. Um, to the west, the, the West Frankish kingdom, that was obviously mostly populated by Fran uh, Franks rather, uh, and, and Gauls that they, they mingled with. And that sort of actual divide is actually uh, one of the reasons that the cultural differences exist between Northern France and Southern France. You have the Southern French uh, Aquitaine. That was more... Um, Gallic, more more Gaul, um, with the northern part being more sort of uh, populated by uh, the Germanic Franks when they came across. Uh, the Eastern Franks, mostly still Germanic. Um, that area, modern day Germany, you know, they, they definitely had their own cultural identity. But the other issue with the central kingdom that we can see is that there is no, there is no one people in that region. That region contains so many different population groups. You've got Italians in the south. You've got the, what would become the Swiss uh, in the mountains. Uh, you've got you've got Germans. You've got uh, French in the middle. You've even got the Dutch up north. Uh, and, and you know, if you go to these regions, to Alsace, um, Alsace Lorraine, that sort of area, which is where we're looking at here, um, that quite often they don't necessarily. Um, consider themselves to be one or the other they consider themselves completely distinct and separate it is just you know it's not a stable sustainable country i can't get this across uh with enough force really um this middle kingdom was eaten almost immediately 
Um, the Italian part separated, uh, you know, with relatively sensible borders uh, at the north. All of those towns and uh, the, the areas in Italy became what we obviously now know as the Italian city-states. You know, you've got Florence, you've got um, Venice, Genoa, uh, Milan, all of those sort of duchies and, and, and little component pieces of northern Italy. They went and just went and did their own thing. They'd stay loosely connected to what would become the Holy Roman Empire, but by the sort of late 1400s, gone, no more contact there. The northern part, however, the part that we're most interested in here with the Netherlands, with Burgundy, um, with kind of northeastern what is today obviously France and, and western what is today Germany, those bits are the bits that I think are the most interesting here. That region has had the vast majority of uh, uh, well, a, a massive majority of wars in Europe taking place either over it or within it. You think um, the Thirty Years' War, massive chunk of that in that sort of region. Uh, you think the Seven Years' War, lots of battles fought there. Uh, the Franco-Prussian War literally fought um, with the idea of, of, of Alsace and Lorraine tacking on to, to what was then Prussia. Um, World War One and World War, well, to an extent World War Two, but World War One especially fought almost in, exclusively uh, the Western Front, at least, in that sort of zone. Um, you've got the pre-Napoleon parts of, of the French Revolution, those battles there where the the uh, the French government of the time was going around slapping the Austrians, slapping the Italians about. That all happened within that region too. Um, the Dutch Revolt, you know, 60, was it 60 or 80 years or something like that, um, happening in the Netherlands because they didn't really feel like they were part of... Uh, of the empire they didn't really feel i mean at the at the time it was a mix of the austrians and spain that were sort of occupying the area they didn't feel like they were part of that at all they wanted complete independence um so you know it has been a real hotbed of activity and i it kind of it, it's a, a thing that you can see throughout history in other places in the world so you know, originally, it wasn't such a big issue. I mean, aside from the initial conquest, what ended up happening was that the uh, the local populations in those areas would have much more uh, loyalty to their, to their feudal lords, right? To their king, their duke, or whoever was in charge of them at the time. Um, and that would be their sort of guiding principle. There was no sort of sense of well, much less of a sense of nationalism. They didn't really, um, generally speaking, go past much past their village. You know, the, the outside world, unless you're a trader or someone that was rich, you didn't have much exposure to it. You were focused on you and yours. But in the 1800s, especially, when nationalism became a big, uh, a, a big factor, you had uh, what's called irredentism, which is wanting to... to uh, get back your lost territory or, or your lost people and because in that central region there are so many people that consider themselves both French or German or and or German or, or something else completely what you had was both sides being able to make the argument that those are our lost people we need to go and uh, take that territory to protect them I mean you see the same thing nowadays in, in Ukraine with um, with Putin saying we're going to march into Ukraine to protect the ethnic Russians, we're going to march into Lugansk and Donetsk to protect the native Russians, we're going to go into Abkhazia and, and South Ossetia to protect native Russians, right? Uh, 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 Transnistria even um, protect native Russians, that's probably the, the best sort of current example that I can give there, but both sides of that divide, when they national uh, when they kind of solidified centralized into the states that we know today of, of france and you know the north german confederation eventually germany they were centering those debates um and their land claims i guess on the fact that their lost people were in this region and you know that is just an example one example i mean Nowadays, you still have unclear borders that are causing issues. Things that are 
um, you know, not delineated by anything like a uh, like a, like a natural formation. I mean, just look. I'm not going to go into t- too much detail because um, I, I plan on doing a little bit of a, an episode later about this sort of thing. But an example would be the Halayib Triangle in uh, between uh, Sudan and Egypt, where both countries are after that area. Um, uh, and and quite famously leaving um, one parcel of land there uh, called Birtawil completely un- unclaimed, the, one of the only places in the world that is unclaimed. Um, that is based on an on a, an Anglo Sudanese treaty from I think the eighteen hundreds, um, and different interpretations of it because it wasn't clear enough uh, mean that there's this sort of standoff there. Um, you have. Uh, Zambia and the Democratic Republic of the Congo fighting over uh, Lunchinda Puerto province, uh, sending troops several times to fight there because of a treaty between British settlers and King Leopold of Belgium from 1894. You know, um, these sort of unclear boundaries just cause all sorts of problems. And I think another big example that well a very small example i suppose but one that's sort of uh become a bit more popular because of oversimplified video uh on the topic was uh the pig war um it was in fact let me i'll get a quick map up here so for those of you that are listening here we're going to western canada um to the to vancouver island which is the island that sticks just off the uh the west coast um, a lot near the border with the US. Initially, the border with the US was supposed to just be completely flat at the, uh, I, think it's, I can't remember which parallel, is it not the, the 38th parallel or is that, that might be Korea. I can't remember the exact parallel, but it was one of the lines of, of latitude um, that they've used to delineate it. That's not so bad as, as a way of, you know, marking a border because no one can really argue about it. Um, any changes that do need to be made are minor and they don't necessarily need um, to be, you know, uh, fought over. Uh, so what we've got is uh, Vancouver Island. And now, back in the day, the UK and uh, the USA were both controlling the northwest part, which is now Oregon, Oregon and uh, Washington State. Um, they run it as a co is it a condominium, a co-condominium or something along those lines. They both had sovereignty over the region. Um, and eventually they decided actually, you know, let's properly delineate the border. Um, we'll, you know, sort out the border exactly. Now, you can see between Vancouver Island and the US um, the mainland, there are a series of little islands here. San Juan Island, Lopez Island, East Sound, uh, Orcas Island, um, so named for various different reasons. Uh, the Spanish actually explored up here uh, way back when, which is uh, why there's a lot of Spanish names up here. Now, um, the treaty that actually delineated the border here said The line of boundary shall continue to the middle of the channel which separates the continent from Vancouver's island and thence southerly through the middle of the said channel and of Fuca Straits to the Pacific Ocean. Now, which channel were they talking about here? And that single misunderstanding, that single vague vague description led almost to a war. with uh you know uh, they had both uh, both groups on there the uk and us citizens and settlers on those islands thinking that they were living in either the uk or the us which meant that they kept on calling on their own law enforcement to settle disputes um which obviously the other side didn't particularly like uh, if you're a, a british citizen and you've got um us troops coming up to you to uh, to have a go for whatever reason you know you're not going to be too thrilled at that um, there was a, a situation where a pig ate some potatoes, uh, the pig got killed, and the farmer who owned the pig got a bit riled up and almost ended up starting an entire war over the, uh, over the islands uh, with, I think it was General Pickett, um, who, who obviously in the, in the US Civil War would go on to um, uh, do Pickett's charge um, at Gettysburg. Um, he wanted a shot at glory. And so he was trying to bait the British into uh, starting a war there. But thankfully, obviously, cooler heads prevailed. 
and that's just you know one example it's a very short one this is a, a very short episode because it's just me that's talking here um but you know that singular decision and the, the singular way that they split up the the region for their sons uh, for for louis the pious's sons has had so many implications for the world not only had the wars been fought there but think about the alliances that got called into these different things um the alliances that got uh, got got called in uh, on different sides of these wars and so you know territorial changes that have happened elsewhere in the world because of it um so whenever we're looking back at history you really do have to you know one thing that you're seeing today could have been caused by something you would never have expected um, and when you're making decisions, you really cannot uh, properly plan for all of the outcomes. I don't think that the, uh, Louis the Pious expected a thousand years of warfare to come from him just making sure that his three kids had, had some land. There was actually a big fight at the time between the two sons from his first marriage. Um, they didn't want this third kid to be included at all, the one from a second marriage. They thought that that was, you know, a um, massive, massive issue. Um, and there was uh, there was a lot of fighting and a lot of war uh, before he even died uh, because of that. So, you know, it's um, definitely uh, something to think about. And it just goes to show how the small things, you know, a little footnote that you might read uh, on Wikipedia or in a history book or wherever could lead to such a massive massive chain of events um that you know we're still living with that impact today the countries that exist in this area the relations between you know france switzerland germany luxembourg belgium the netherlands all still uh all still um colored by by the decision that was made over a thousand years ago anyway that's that's basically it from me for now. I'm just going to have a quick look at the uh, Twitch chat, see if there's anything that is worth uh, discussing, because that has been going on for a while in the background. I appreciate covering this in my history class. Oh, nice, nice. It was weird. beard. Where's the fancy? Okay. I don't think there's anything particularly interesting there. So I will uh, I will call it there. Um, thank you for joining me. This was again. This was just a bit of a test. Uh, a very short, very short one with just me uh, and nobody else. Um, I'll pop this up on on Spotify when I get the chance. But otherwise, thank you for uh, thank you for watching. Um, there will also be a couple of uh, shorts going up on YouTube in the very near future as well. So keep an eye out for that. Thank you. Goodbye.